right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Happy Tuesday. My name is Tanisha Clark, and I'm a clinical social worker in the Collaborative Care Program um, in the Department of Population Health. Um, this morning, we're going to hear from a great speaker, Dr. Megan O'Reilly. During her presentation, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and then we'll save 10 minutes at the end um, for her to answer your questions. So go ahead and send those away, and I will review them. Um, Dr. Megan O'Reilly is a staff psychologist in, at Stanford University's Counseling and Psychological Services. While completing her postdoc fellow at CAPS, Dr. O'Reilly created the first satellite clinic for Black students, which increased access for drop-in for immediate support, ongoing support, and first-time support. After her fellowship, she was hired on as staff and became the program coordinator for outreach, equity, and inclusion. In this role, Dr. O'Reilly is part of a team that sets the vision and initiatives which advocate for increased support and education to members of the Stanford community, particularly those from underrepresented and marginalized communities and those who don't utilize traditional counseling services as much. When she's not providing treatment, Dr. O'Reilly is a lecturer for human health and performance in the Stanford School of Medicine, where she teaches Wellness 110, the science of motivation and procrastination. Outside of Stanford, Dr. O'Reilly is the co-founder and CEO of Inherent Value Psychology. In her private practice, she provides DEI consulting, workshops, trainings, and international speaking engagements, as well as group and individual clinical services for Silicon Valley professionals. The mission of Inherent Value Psychology is to redefine productivity as liberating the unconditional self. Dr. O'Reilly is also a consultant at Lyra Health, a Bay Area mental health startup, and a consultant for the United Negro College Fund's STEM Scholar Program. This program helps Black students navigate the emotional stressors of underrepresentation and discrimination in the STEM fields. Notably, Dr. O'Reilly took to the TEDx stage in 2018 to remind us all of our unconditional worth as people and how life can exponentially improve when we believe that we matter to the world. Her TED talk, Enough is Enough, The Power of Your Inherent Value can be seen on YouTube. Dr. O'Reilly's research focuses on social justice and her areas of clinical, clinical expertise include college mental health, perfectionism, trauma, and social identities, particularly race, social class, and gender. She is the author of System-Centered Language, a Necessity to Speaking Truth to Power During COVID-19 and Confronting Racism. This article has received over 10,000 views and Dr. O'Reilly will be conducting research on its core tenets. Dr. O'Reilly believes deeply in the transformative power of psychological science to liberate and improve lives. And with that mission in mind, I'd like to warmly welcome her to UCSF. Dr. O'Reilly, take it away. Well, thank you, Tanisha. Um, it is always a very special honor to have a friend introduce you and to read your bio. Um, there's many moments that you know the behind the scenes of those accomplishments. So I thank you, Tanisha. And I thank everyone for being here today. I'm very excited and honored to give this uh, talk, this workshop to you all. Um, this is a workshop that I give regularly every academic year to our, our psychiatry residents, our psychology interns, and our psychology postdoctoral fellows over at Baden Health Center. And I'm just overjoyed that it's going to get a larger audience today. Um, just a little bit more about me as a presenter. I think there's a lot of wisdom and experience in the room. So there will be a few times where I pause for us to chime in with either questions, anecdotes, or examples of your own. Do you fire off in the chat because Zoom is where we live now and Tanisha will field those for me. And uh, we even have our tech support running back up on unmuting people if, we, if someone does want to verbally share. So I welcome that. And lastly, my intention for today um, I like setting intentions even for my workshops. And my intention is to share the content, but 
mainly to have this space that we're co-creating together, something that is shared today or something that resonates or lingers with you, I want it to transfer into a better care for a marginalized group, which is often, too often, our Black, Brown, Indigenous, poor, or immigrant clients. So I hope that something germinates from today and there's a lot of good content that will shepherd us on that way. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, <clears throat> the title of our talk is very intentional. It is The Long Road to Liberation, The Evolution of Social Justice Practice and Implications for Clinical Care. Okay. Let, and Prezi's are a little different than PowerPoint. Let me get my advancing going, excellent. So this talk is one part Social Justice 101 and review and one part call to action. The task I want all of you to hold as we move through this content is to see if you can identify yourself in one of these stages of development, one of these stages of social justice mindset. Now, this isn't gonna be something we're gonna share out um, afterwards as a group. This is something I want you to hold privately to yourself. Um, and then, then I want you to under, understand what's the next stage beyond the one I'm at. And let me make sure I leave today with an understanding how to cross that bridge, okay? That will become clear as we press on. So in the beginning, social justice. A lot of, there's a lot of good definitions of social justice, but social justice emerged out of oppression, out of the need to change oppressive systems, oppressive practices, and of oppressive interactions for people. Now, uh, I remember coming up with my own definition of social justice for my dissertation, which looked at social class and help seeking behaviors in college students. And it was a paragraph long as all dissertation definitions are. But I wanna read you a more concise definition of social justice that we can hold in our mind as we progress through these stages. Social justice is a concept of fair and just relations between individuals and society as measured by the distribution of wealth, opportunities for personal activity and social privileges. So there's a lot we can un unpack there, but we hear the levels of individual and institutional, we hear about engagement, and we hear about privileges and uh, accessibility. So we're starting out with overt isms. Um, these are the outward expressions of oppression and hate that are true across all different types of oppression. Um, racism, sexism, classism, uh, gender discrimination, uh, ableism, and so on. However, we are gonna be focusing on racism um, as it's my area of expertise and uh, most easily uh, cleanly applied to these mindsets that we're gonna be going through. So mindset zero um, is the evote isms, harboring outward hate um, and discrimination. So, I have a little image here that went viral a couple of years ago. It's a triangle shaped image that shows overt and covert um, institutions of white supremacy. Um, feel free to lean in and take a better look at what is um, below and above the line. But I love sharing this with folks because uh, this is not a triangle just for aesthetic graphic design purposes. It's a triangle to really show us that there's a pyramid effect, that the things that are covert give rise and form the base for things that eventually become overt. A lot of times we look at the overt and say, I'm not doing any of those things, so I'm good. But however, these build off of the covert. So it is worth our time to look below the line and see things of like colorblind jokes or tokenism, denial of racism, um, uh, self, you know, self-appointed white allyship, you know, these things below the line were much more likely to stumble into or do. Um, and it does, it can give rise um, to the more overt things that we're more mindful of not uh, participating in. So mindset zero that I know none of us are in is this overt uh, harboring of oppression and prejudice. Let's press on. Mindset one. So is Colorblindness. Now, as you can think about human behavior, behavior change, there was a very drastic pendulum swing from overt isms and overt oppression to colorblindness. You know, when people saw that, you know, when social justice was just getting started through civil rights 
rights movements and a lot of different social movements and a lot of different sectors, people were holding the fact that, you know, seeing that people are different, treating people differently and poorly and oppressively because of their differences is bad. Let's not do that anymore. Unfortunately, they swung past the middle all the way to colorblindness, which basically says, I don't see differences. I don't see color, I don't see gender, I don't see ethnicity, I don't see ability status, I don't see any difference because that's the better place to be. And the country and operations were as hooked on colorblindness as it, as it was heralded as the right way to be, the better way to be, right? So colorblind is a practice that believes that treating people equally, everyone gets the same, inherently leads to a more equal society. And when it's said that way, a little, some of us could resonate with that. If I treat everyone equally, that will bring about more equality. One of the statutes uh, and laws that really typify this was Plessy versus Ferguson. And as since we know our, our civil rights history, we know that this is the, the law that upheld racial segregations in public sectors like our schools. And this law was founded and really supported about this mindset of colorblindness. It held that, you know, if we keep the races separate and just made sure everything was equal, which was not the case. But if we made things sure that things were equal, that would be better for everybody, right? And a lot of people got behind us. This was the law of the land, right? And so there's obviously a lot of complications in how this gets rolled out and in the tenet of thinking this way itself. Essentially, colorblindness allows any ism, particularly racism, to continue to enact itself just undetected. I hope the, those of us in this group today are reading White Fragility. It's a really good uh, account of how not noticing whiteness allows it to enact itself and colorblindness is, is strong among that, that type of practice. However, we saw a resurgence of colorblindness. Social justice has moved past this, but we saw a resurgence of colorblindness after President Obama's election. Now, we could think to ourselves, why would that be? But I'll answer it for you. Once a biracial black president was elected to the highest office of the land, uh, people thought that that was the sign or emblematic that we're past our racial tensions and that we uh, ushered into a post-racial world. There is this desire to want to not work on the struggles that are, are, that are there, to be further along than we are. But I like to say to my clients that you can't leave from somewhere until you arrive there. And so we, we're, we're skipping a step. Colorblindness essentially is a skipping a step and it's not seeing the differences that we ought to attend to to actually get to the, the just world that we're wanting to live in. So take a moment, this is mindset one. Colorblindness, could we be there? In our practice, this could look like treating everyone the same. This would look like me as a psychologist uh, working with a white male rural, in a rural setting who has access to guns and not doing who's depressed and not doing a very thorough suicide assessment because, you know, I'm going to ignore those risk factors or those differences and do the same cookie cutter depression um, approach. It, in the medical field, it would look like having a black pregnant woman and not checking her for preeclampsia, not checking her for gestational diabetes earlier because, you know, most white women don't have that and maybe most of your clientele don't have those symptoms. So when we don't see the nuance or the difference or the differences that someone brings into the room, we're gonna be not tailoring our interventions and our practice. So colorblindness is actually quite dangerous, okay? I like to say that people like to be uh, recognized for their differences, but not reduced to those differences. And we can have both. We can see difference and not pigeonhole someone into that. So this is mindset one, colorblindness. Do a little self check and we'll press on. Ah, one quote that I love to say real quick is uh, if we're looking to legality to uh, give us a margin of what's right and wrong, we can get astray because the Holocaust was legal, slavery was legal, um, and even our, our institutions don't get it right. We know that the DSM had hurtful things about uh, homosexuality. We know it has hurtful things about different groups and different groups of people disproportionately get different diagnoses. So this is actually a little bit of a rebellious call to examine the law of the land, examine the, the institutions and rule books that we use as a yardstick because they're evolving too and they're made by people too. So it's always good to have a little bit of 
upstream, a little bit of against the grain and asking bigger and larger questions. Okay, mindset two is diversity. So we're progressing now into a better understanding. Diversity simply says, I see differences. We are different and that's a beautiful thing that we should embrace. Now, some people are getting a little comfortable. Megan, what's wrong with diversity? It's still in all of our titles. We put it in all of our promotional materials. It's a, a tenant that we uphold in all of our mission statements and that is all good. However, how it gets rolled out, how a theory is applied makes all the difference and we know this. So the problem with mindset too is that sometimes diversity gets rolled out in a very stereotypical way. And I and can hold um, the onus of this a little bit too because my graduate program presented difference in this way. One week we talked about uh, Asian clients. Another week we talked about Latinx client. Another week we talked about black clients. And if we're not careful, what we go from is colorblind, I don't see difference, to diversity, I see difference and all that difference is the same. So if you're working with a Latinx client, it's about machismo and collectivist culture and all these stereotypical cursory things we know. If we're working with a black client, um, you know, it's about um, the, the, the family structure is matriarchal and it's collectivist and all this. If we're working with an Asian client, it's about field of piety, education and all these things, right? And I like sharing a, a, stereo, a, a microaggression that I received in my own therapy, because therapists get therapy, just like doctors have doctors, um, that really typifies this type of training um, and the, the pitfalls. So in an intake session with my therapist, white woman, um, she was you know, going through those different domains and asked me about my upbringing and family constellation. And I said, both my mom and dad are nurses in the Air Force. And she pauses and say, oh, your father's in the home. Nice, that's great. It still kind of hurts when I hear that. I would love to hear um, if anyone feels comfortable, what's the microaggression there? And what from her diversity training had her show up that way? I'll pause if someone wants to write in the chat or speak to us. What's the microaggression based on what identity I hold and what might have come from her diversity training that allowed her to show up that way to me? I see some chats. We have something, Megan, um, the stereotype of the absent black father. Mm -hmm. um, black fathers are absent. Mm -hmm. Assumption that a black father was absent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spot on, spot on. Me presenting to her as obviously a black woman uh, and some, you, you know that some training in her past or recent past had told her when you're working with a different client, when you're working with a black client, you know, check in about the family, get the family structure and be ready to hear that the father isn't, isn't present and be ready to, you know, assess that trauma. Again, not bad that, that, that there, are, there, there are different family constellations and different groups and we would need to know that. Much like I would ask maybe a Southeast Asian client where their parents-in-law are living because it's likely that they're living nearby or in an in-law's house. But the microaggression is that she assumed the outcome, not just to be aware of a potentiality, but she assumed the outcome and then made that known in a very disparaging, patronizing way. So thank you all, you all are right on it. With that example, we can see how this, this mindset can be rolled out um, unhelpfully, okay? So do a self-check. Am I in the diversity? Do I see difference? But am I doing it too stereotypically? Again, people want to be seen for their differences, but not relegated to those differences. All right. Woo, Prezi. All right. Mindset three, multiculturalism. Okay, we're getting closer. Multiculturalism is understanding each other and moving beyond simple tolerance to embracing and celebrating the rich dimensions of diversity contained in each individual. What I love about this that definition is the rich dimensions, right? This is diversity within the diversity, right? So you're even look, you're still looking at one group or difference and you're seeing all the different ways that that can be done. So I like likening this to a mosaic where it's making one picture, but there's, it's all made up of little different elements, right? And so this is now I see difference and I see how those differences can be manifested, okay? 
for those of us um, on the more clinical side or the psychology side, I don't know what the correlate is for medicine, but this was the image that we had to sear into our memory for our comprehensive exams, for the diversity category of our exams. And I saw this image kind of grow over time through my education. At first it was a one dimensional kind of flat plane um, uh, representation of what diversity is. And then it became two dimensional. And now it's a cube with a lot of depth. I think we're trying to, you know, get a handle on this uh, social justice diversity, how humanity shows up with so much difference. And I think trying to get a handle of it helps and hinders sometimes because when you categorize something, you're, all, you're, you're instantly pigeonholing it in a way. But along the side, we have the different ethnic groups. We have different levels here, individual, clinical, organizational. And then we have another row of dimensions of you know, cultural awareness, cultural knowledge, behavioral awareness, skill development. So this is how at least counseling psychology was trying to hold the richness of multiculturalism. Let's think about how multiculturalism shows up in our practices. This means that you give me two people with depression, maybe even from the same cultural group, and I'm able to tailor that to their specific needs and their specific factors of what's causing their depression, right? A lot of times people, when they get a diverse client and our, our patient in front of them, they want to kind of cookie cut the a present, the, the tailor of the interventions, when a lot of times that ma major salient identity might not have anything to do with what they're bringing in. And multiculturalism stance would allow you to quickly pivot and meet the client with their whatever need that they're actually coming in for. Okay, so we're getting more degrees of dimension and flexibility. Do I see the chat lighten up? Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on now to inclusion. Inclusion is actually fairly green when it comes to diversity or multiculturalism. It is, we hear the word a lot, but a lot of us don't quite know what it looks like, what it actually means, and how to actually embody it or weave that practice into our practice. So inclusion now moves from, I don't see color, I see difference. I don't see differences, I see differences. There's differences among those differences. Now inclusion is saying, I want those differences. Those differences actually represent a rich experience. And I want that experience, not just the difference identifier, to be participatory in whatever I'm doing. And I picked this, this picture to really represent inclusion because it's not just that your color or your strand is represented. It's, not, 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 just, it's just not that the purple strand is here. The purple strand is actually interwoven into the larger band. So now we're moving from representation, which was basically diversity. You're, quota, checkbox, someone of that group is here and present, tokenism. Now it's moving from representation to participation. You actually have not only a seat at the table, but also a microphone that's actually turned on. You have, you can include your thoughts, your experiences, your walk of life into what's happening at the table. So I love this table that I've posted here because it lines up diversity and inclusion right beside each other. Diversity is you know, a company holding the unique differences and similarities of our employees, customers, and suppliers, and communicates or brings a global, brings that into the global business understanding, okay? That's, that's something you would hear on a business diversity statement. While inclusion would sound like, we define inclusion as seeking out and valuing and using the knowledge and experience of our diverse employees for business benefit. So again, moving from present to participation. What does this look like in our practices? Well, it can look a lot of different ways. I like to say that I tell every client that um, the magic that of therapy happens together. I have expertise in behavior change and psychology, but they have expertise in what it's like to be them. Um, and so I need that expertise in the room. And I actually ask them to ask questions and challenge things. So I would say, especially as medical doctors, there's an inherent power differential there. There's always an inherent power differential when someone's coming in for help and you are the holder of that help, but even more so with the MD title, right? It's particularly for certain cultures too. We, we pedestalize our doctors. And so what inclusion would look like is really leveling the playing field, inviting on several occasions for that participation in their wellness, in their healthcare, in their the behavioral interventions that's required of them and not positioning yourself as the fixer or the know-it-all 
really inviting and seeking and weaving in their expertise, their knowledge and their participation in what's going to be their care, okay? And there's a lot of different ways that can look, but if we're in this mindset, we're, we're on the lookout for it. We're, we're looking for exceptions at times where they didn't fall prey to their, 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 their diagnosis, times where we can uplift them, times where we can bring in more of that participation, okay? Let's press on. Okay. Our next mindset, it's getting harder. We're, we're moving away probably from what we know. So if that discomfort's happening for you, stay tuned, that's okay. So diversity, multiculturalism, inclusion, now we're at the equity mindset, okay? Equity is really best um, represented by this image and by an experience I had way pre-COVID that I wanna share with you. Uh, I got the difference between equality and equity when I was at a social justice conference and the workshop leader had us take off our shoes. I know, but they had us take off our shoes and um, put on someone else's shoes. I know, I don't know why I participate in this. I'm such a rule follower. Um, but we, everyone put on someone else's pair of shoes and walked around the room a little bit. Now I had apparently someone, a clown shoes, big, big old boat shoes, and my foot was not even taking a path of it. And I was imagining if that person had my Cinderella feet, size six, they probably wouldn't, work, wouldn't even be able to stand. But we're walking around these shoes struggling. And he basically said, this is a quality. Everyone has shoes on their feet, right? But equity is like having shoes that fit, shoes made for you, shoes that can actually equip you to get around uh, efficiently because they're tailored to your actual foot. And I just never forgot that because of how visceral the experience was <laughs> in unsanitary, but also because when I got my shoes back on, I was like, oh, thank God, I can actually move you know, at a regular speed now. And same for the gentleman that had my shoes. So as we can see here, giving everyone the same box based on the statures of these characters, you know, the, the shortest in stature still can't see over the fence. However, when we give everyone what they need, the shorter stature person has two boxes, the middle stature has one, and the tall person doesn't have any. And I pause here because when equity is moving from theory to application, this is the most contentious part. When some person has not, doesn't get any uh, uh, support and someone gets twice the amount that this person did. When that actually is in practice, uh, there's a lot of feelings about this, okay? We see this in as college admittance where, you know, people are still worrying about how affirmative action actually works and who benefits from it. And did someone take my spot? We've actually seen lawsuits, usually uh, white, white female students uh, suing a school because someone got in that they don't think should have, right? So there's a lot of feelings and tensions around what equity needs to look like, right? But when we look, everyone can see the outcome is what it needs to be. And so if we're the person getting two boxes or the person getting none, it's, it's important to check why do I feel some, some type of way about this? And what is the actual outcome? What is there actual harm being done, right? Okay, we'll pause there. Because the last mindset, I have to say, I haven't seen much of. You know, I, I'm seeing a lot of inclusion. Um, sometimes I see things still in the diversity or multiculturalism stage, sometimes the colorblind stage. But this last stage, I, I haven't quite seen much of. And so this is the stage where I spend most of my time um, and trying to envision something and embody something that we haven't quite arrived at. And that stage is liberation and justice. I put these on the same mindset level. Um, and so what is liberation? Liberation is this last image. I, when I first saw this image, I was blown away um, because I was someone feverishly working behind the fence. You know, how do we get the boxes? How do we distribute the boxes? How do we make everyone okay with the distribution of boxes? But liberation is about moving the fence, moving the obstruction that was there in the first place. So this is an analogy or a metaphor, but what the question is, what are the fences in our practice? The fences are those oppressive systems that are impeding the, the view of the baseball game or what we would say impeding participation in the game of life, right? That social justice definition, the activity, the participation, the privileges. And so I can say for counseling, 
one of the biggest fences is access to care. Our whole healthcare system, our, our, our insurance and things like that. There are people that need care that can't pull over pull vote over that fence. And we're squabbling behind the fence of how to get the stick to get over it. And so liberation is about dismantling the fence one plank at a time, but at first we have to know the fence is there. And that's why understanding oppression is so important. Let me drop in the chat something that I have for y'all. It's called <clears throat> The Five Faces of Oppression. That's a wonderful short read. It talks about how oppression shows up and I would love for y'all to look at that. It's its own uh, workshop. But here's why I also have justice on this last mindset, social justice mindset. Since liberation is hard, since liberation is something that is an ongoing process that we have to dismantle, because there's a reason why it's designed this way, we usually get to liberation through justice. Justice as I'm defining it as, you know, some harm or hindrance has been done by oppression and justice is the system of how we write that, allay, solve, remove that harm that has been done if we can. When it's loss of life, there's usually no full justice that can be done, but we can seek justice through altering systems, changing practices, making more equitable practices. Um, so we get to liberation often through justice, okay? This is our final mindset. And when we get there, after that, the sky's the limit. <clears throat> okay. I would love to uh, take questions now and pause my share screen so I can see some of y'all's faces. Okay. <clears throat> Shockingly, Megan, we have no questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I see people diligently taking notes, yeah. but there are no questions. So if anybody has no questions too big, no questions too small, mm -hmm. so please. It's probably so. resonating, I'm fine with that. Some things have to uh, germinate over time. Mm -hmm. I did wanna say, I think that principle of liberation comes in, right, systems change. Yes. Systems change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Let me, speaking of systems, uh, I wanna drop in the link to the article you mentioned. <clears throat> As people are either taking notes or just letting some of this sit, I do want uh, people to ask themselves, did you see uh, yourself in any of these mindset stages? Log for yourself which one it was. And then what's the one after that? And do you have a framework or an understanding of what it would take to move from where you are to where you could go next? That's the real uh, gem of this workshop. Question, Megan. Yes. Um, one person too actually wants to know if we will be getting the slides to your presentation. So that is a yes. And then um, question from Lex, what are some of the steps you would like to see psychologists take to institute greater systemic change? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of steps. Um, I think that one step that I love when psychologists do is to do preventative work. So uh, thinking with our knowledge and expertise of being a social scientist, thinking about how do I partner with communities to build up their own healthy behaviors in the community itself? Basically more of a community mental health model where we're not just giving away, they come to us in these one hour weeks to give these gems, but we can preventively teach certain types of psychoeducation and, and healthy behaviors. And then the community can just keep giving it to itself opposing different community, working with already established community leaders, um, making sure that therapy and counseling isn't the only source to wellness, using whatever the community already has built in and just partnering to strengthen those. And so we get less of a need to even come in to begin with, right? That's my favorite. That's essentially outreach. That's essentially community building. And there's an organization that I partnered with um, called BEAM, it's Black Emotional Mental Health Collective, that does this so well. They have something called Healing Justice, where it's a whole program of community members healing themselves. So I think that's one way to break, uh, to take a plank out of the fence of going in where it's already happening, helping folks help themselves, empowering people, and then be waiting in the wings if and when it's needed, because the health has already begotten itself in the community where it's needed. So that's one that I love. I see lots of head nods, Megan. Ah. Yeah, throw up the clap hands. This is where we live now. 
<laughs> oh yeah, reaction. Any other question right now? Mm. Love that question. Hey, Sheila. <laughs> I think people are just taking it all in. Mm -hmm. It appears like based on the affects I'm seeing, it, yeah, people look attentive, yeah. Megan. Mm -hmm. I will say um, the hardest stage organizationally or institutionally is going from inclusion to equity and definitely equity deliberation. There, I can drop it in the chat. There is a, um, a stage model of how to become an anti-racist organization and I see a lot of organizations start out on that path, but sometimes we hit a ceiling because of the, because our power runs out. Um, and so it's, it's something to think about of, you know, in my own sphere, what is the fence and what can I do to take a plank out? We might not take down the whole board, but we all can be chipping away at it. I, I would say that's one of the hardest leaps from equity to liberation because it's baked into the system. These, are, these oppressive ways of um, how people are oppressed. Megan, we have a request to see the justice slide again. Um, it was very powerful and concise. Mm -hmm. Do you mind going back to that? Yes, I can. Da, 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 da. See, I had all my technology set up and now, okay, here we go. Justice slide. Oh, and I skipped uh, something I wanted to reiterate, but let me, let me take us to our justice slide. Oh, we have a like a repeat of the of the definition of social justice that you gave at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So maybe liberation, mm -hmm. the justice, and this we yeah, have the social justice wanting to review that. Perfect. And then I have another gem for us. So here is our justice slide. Take it in. Equality. Everyone gets the same. Equity. People get what they need. This is like having the shoes that fit that we talked about. And then liberation, no one needs these boxes because the blockade has been removed, All right? So that's, that's the highest system level um, action point, our mindset to be in. Um, so we get through liberation, to liberation often through justice by righting wrongs and um, bringing things back to as they should be before the oppression was inflicted, okay? All right. This question, oh, sorry, Megan. The definition that I gave of social justice is, social justice is a concept of fair and just relations between individuals and society as measured by the dis distribution of wealth, opportunities, and personal activity and social privileges. All right. Um, a comment, the idea of liberation is very powerful because I don't think the majority of people see it as like freeing, a freeing factor. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So one more, this is similar to what you answered, but this is more focused on training and development. How would you like to see psychology graduate and professional training change to help us more effectively toward equity and liberation? Mm -hmm. So be more effective training. in the training programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that would be a good time for me to share this other gem. It's, um, uh, from a different PowerPoint that I have. Let me pull it up real quick. I, I go, I make this labor because it's a GIF and you gotta get, you gotta see the motion for it to make sense. So let me share my screen and I will answer that question. What do I, what do I wanna see in the training? So, <clears throat> okay. Um, many of us have seen these different terms, inclusion, diversity, um, equity, um, but I, I wanna talk a little bit about the differences amongst these terms. Um, diversity, and this is not my analogy, this comes from Dorika Blackman, who's a colleague, a former colleague of mine at Stanford, who's gone on to do other things. But diversity is like getting an invitation to the party. You're invited, you get to show up, you're present. Inclusion is like being asked to dance. You're on the dance floor, you're participating. Uh, belonging though, is being able to dance the way you see fit. And this is the power of the gift. This guy is really going at it, doing something different. This is dancing in unison, right? And then equity is being like able to pick the DJ, right? Now you have some say in the actual orchestration of the party, okay? So to go to this, uh, this colleague's question, 
um, what I would like to see in training is more belonging and equity and how we bring up our psychologists and how we allow them to participate. Cause it's usually our younger uh, emerging clinicians that have new ideas, that have different experiences that are more on the cusp of what's changing. That's one other thing I should underscore in these different social justice evolutions is that it's, it's, it's constantly as it should be pushing to the next evolution of what's best for humanity, what's best for people to thrive and be included in this vision of what social justice and liberation is. So it's not gonna stay static. We need young blood and we need to keep sharpening the cutting edge. And so one thing I would like in training is to actually allow more voice from our younger clinicians, um, allow more of their experience and definitely that belonging and include an equity sense in what they can bring to the table. Because for too often we just do the same thing all the time. And in some institutions, I think medicine's one of them, there's a little bit of hazing. Like this is what I went through. This is what was hard for me. Let me pass that down and make it that way for you. When really it could be quite different um, and better for everyone involved. I dropped in the chat my um, system-centered language. That's another thing I would love uh, for our institutions and training to do, which would be to dismantle even how we think about how we talk about people experiencing oppression. So give that a read, um, let me know what your thoughts are, but it's really a way that we can advocate even in how we speak about people. It's essentially a person's first language, but it's centering the system in everything that we do. So we don't end up faulting the individual and thus treating them differently. We'll see what the research bears, but I would love for everyone to chew on that way of thinking about approaching a person experiencing oppression. Megan, we have a few more questions, but I'm mindful of the time. I'm wanting to make sure you finish everything and then we can do, I can save what we have for question and answer, or do you want to take them now? Uh, yes, that's my content. I would love, I'd love more questions. Okay, let's see. Let me go back up here. Okay, this is a good one. I'm curious what your thoughts are about how to address DEI issues when, for instance, the marginalized group is a white rural population. Mm -hmm. I understand how they feel marginalized, but also may not necessarily identify with how DEI is traditionally represented. Okay. Good question. Yes, let me chew on it. How am I going to be on the mic? Okay, all right. Oh, this is why I like this question. I like it because it's asking us to really think about our definitions of diversity, number one, who is a diverse client? Everyone's diverse, right? Um, and the difference between diversity and marginalization. I like to say marginalized because marginalization is something we do to people. Um, check out System Center. Um, how, I would, uh, how I would approach this, and this is my in the moment thoughts, would be to look at, much like I would do it with anyone, the doing assessment of what is the oppression being experienced? What is the limitation to access? And what is the harm being done because of those things? Now, if this white rural person is, has those three elements in their experience, that's where I can meet them. Even I won't get caught up with them on, you know, defining them as diverse or, you know, trying to make them fit into a definition they don't feel like they fit into. I would, I would target the intervention with the experience being had with the lack of access or the harm being created or the oppression being inflicted on them. And sharing that worldview, bringing in their own reported experience of whatever's going on for them with some type of diminishment or distress and meeting them there because that's, that's our, I, wanna, I won't call it leverage, but that's our connecting point. That's the shared humanity point where let me meet you with what's distressing you. This is what we call it. This is how I see it, take it or leave it. And this is what we can do about it. Okay. Excellent. Um, a few of you are asking for to links again. I think hopefully we can ask Gina to send out all the links in your presentation. I think they're super helpful. Based, yeah, and a lot of people are requesting. Uh, requesting here because this is an ongoing conversation. Great, right. Megan. Okay, Megan. How do you work with people of color who are fatigued with having to explain to others about racism and microaggressions? Every day, every day. How do I work with them? First, I acknowledge it. First, I just acknowledge the fatigue because if they're acknowledging fatigue, they're probably burnt out. They're probably beyond burnt out if they're just now acknowledging fatigue. At least that's what I found in my own life and in a lot of walks of, of people of color that are doing this um, because their threshold for fatigue is already very high. 
So I acknowledge it. And then I gently walk them through, when did this become your job? When did this become your job? And what is your goal? What is your outcome, right? I, there's a micro responding to microaggressions presentation that I love to give, um, partly because it's tangible. I created a flow chart of if then, then this. And the very first flow is safety and self-preservation and protection. Like, do you have it? If not, take a minute. Like taking that time to remove yourself from a, a potentially contentious or even dangerous situation or just emotionally taking care of yourself. That's the number one step. Um, but then I kind of walk them through, when did this become your job? It's actually not your job. And depending on who it is, the context, the relationship, the power dynamic, you actually have a lot of different options and you can feel empowered in choosing any of those options. You're not a bad person of color if you don't take every opportunity to educate someone. Because the other hard truth that we hold together is that wonderful dissertation that you pull down the chalkboard and give them might not even land well. It might become more work for you. It might not be what they need to pivot. Because I think inherently what we're holding is I got to teach or do all this work for the culture, for the cause, toward liberation. And the biggest thing they could do toward liberation is be well is to get, to get there themselves. So I really just like shifting the paradigm of what is required of them in any situation, offering them other options. So there's a diversity, so that might be less fatiguing and then allowing them to step back and tag others in. Some people like to call this social justice work a marathon because it is. I like to call it a relay. You're gonna need to hand it off and take a breath and stretch and then go again. And so that's how I like to work with it. Excellent, I love that, I love that. that's great, Megan. Um, more, keep going with the questions. I'll take some more. Okay. How can community mental health programs in San Francisco knock down a plank of the fence? And I think that question could be just spread out to any mental health program, knock down a plank of the fence. Mm. Knock down a plank. Well, I think it begins with a, a real honest and raw assessment of what the planks are and why they're there. Um, and this is actually quite hard because when we're assessing the planks, one, we see our own participation in the plank sometimes, and that's hard to hold and see. And then we start to see why the planks are there and what really old uh, white supremacy values or institutions or money or power it traces back to. If you look long enough, you run dead into a system. And the other hard thing about identifying the planks is once you really start seeing the links of the chain and seeing the system, it gets pretty big. Um, and that can feel pretty fatiguing and overwhelming as well. But we gotta do that so we can kind of locate ourselves in that just position. And then we can zoom back down. So we zoom out, then we can zoom back down to what is a splinter on this plank in the fence. And then we start just hatcheting away. And so that's way we can feel a little, because it can be helpless inducing work, right? But when we can bring it back down, chunk it, partner, always have a team, this work is hard, partner and innovate and start changing the, the needle, that's how change accumulates. So I would say start with an assessment of what the planks are, uh, get a good understanding of how it operates, and then see if you can change a gear in it by maybe a new program or a pilot program or just tweaking how something's done. And then that begets a virtuous cycle that eventually could remove a whole plank. So always think long game. You, I know as high achievers, we wanna, we wanna go from A to Z and have it be wonderful and no detours. Think long game, think scenic route, and also think laterally networking, not just above. You know, Oh, I need the CEO to do this or I need the president to do that. Yes, you want their ear, but a lot of change starts right where you're at and then trickles up. So that's another way I would think about it. Okay. Um, this is the last question we have for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, Dr. O'Reilly. What would you say is the most inclusive title for a social justice oriented committee? For example, diversity and inclusion committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, this is a great question because I know right now lots of communities are being formed. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Mm, mm, mm. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, I love the question because it's leading with the right intention. Like how do we even pre present ourselves so we're received the way what we intend to? 
some, I'll, I'll speak from two parts of me. I love parts language. One part of me is thinking, um, have all the terms in there, you know, in, inclu inclusive equity board, you know. I personally have been toying around with the idea of liberation leader or liberation guide, um, th getting liberation more into our nomenclature and our lexicon. That's one part of me, you know, like, you know, think about what the main tenets are and put all the words that represent that, but then title gets really long. The other part of me is thinking, what if we use none of those words? Because some, it's in some spaces it's becoming a buzzword and people kind of can turn their ear off to it. Like, oh, another inclusion group, okay. Another part of me is thinking maybe use none of those words and, and pick different words that really resonate with the core tenets and the mission of what the committee is trying to do. That way it's a fresh eye, a fresh ear to the people you're presenting yourselves to. And so there's many ways to go. I would say, you know, think about it long and hard as a committee and um, go with what feels good with the heart because um, that's where really where people resonate. You know, they, they hear it through their senses and through their head, but the behaviors that the committee comes up with, think about what title would really hold and represent that well. Great answer. Okay, thank you for this presentation. You mentioned an anti-racist stage model for organizations. Mm -hmm. Do you have a specific resource for this? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head where it came from. Um, CAPS does these DEI Wednesdays and I got it from one of our Wednesdays. Let me send it to Gina to send out in the laundry list of links from today because it's a really nice thing to look at because in, individually we're thinking about this presentation and where you may fall in your mindset and how that shows up in your practice. But this one would help you look organizationally. Where is my, where's, my org, where's my org at right now? And what can I do to help push them to the next stage? Okay, so I'll send that along. Okay. I like that. Where my org at? That's a good, that's a good question. I yeah. make a t-shirt. Okay. We are far from achieving equity in society and in mental health care. Do we work on equity first or go straight for liberation? Good question. Ooh, good question. Oof. Okay, I'm gonna lock it in. I'm gonna say, let's shoot for liberation. Let's suit for liberation. And if we fall short, then maybe we'll hit equity, you know, all the ones below it, almost like the shoot for the star, moon, if you land them on the stars type thing. I'm saying let's shoot for liberation because that's where we're going. And to be short sighted could do us harm. Like it's almost like filling up your gas tank and only using, you know, half of it. Like let's use all that we got. And I'll also say that <clears throat> There is some, in some social justice sectors, or at least how I've experienced the space, there is a insidious, uh, almost DMV model to social justice. We gotta work now serving this group, now serving that group, like get in line and this person, this group is most oppressed, this group is most pressing, we're gonna help them and then we'll help you, you know, we'll get to you, you know, and we know the DMV takes forever. That's why I don't like that model. Because we know, or if we know, I hope we know, that all oppression is linked uh, and feeds into each other and is intertwined, that really says start anywhere, start everywhere. Start with what's passionate on your heart where you can make change, where you can be an ally and it will ripple through the system. So we don't have to start with just one group or community. We don't have to start with just multiculturalism or inclusion. We can be shooting for liberation all the while and be amassing all the goodness along the way and all the other stages. So I wanna say, start wherever you have passion and ability and shoot for liberation. Love it, okay. How do we reconcile, this is a pretty global question, but how do we reconcile that oppressive system are driving and maintaining poor mental health and it's not just inequitable access? How do we reconcile that? Yeah. If we can reconcile, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna put on my process hat, you know, often we wanna do something about something because actions matter. However, oftentimes the first thing to do is just hold it, is just behold it and sit with what that means. I think one way to be with it would be to start listening to the 1619 podcast. There's one episode in particular, I think it's called Bad Blood. I think it's episode four. 
that talks about this long through line about why some pieces of the healthcare system are the way they are right now and why it's based on white supremacy values and who it keeps out and who it helps and how help is rendered and not rendered. And we have to sit with that. Again, we can't leave from somewhere until we arrive there. And we're still having a hard time arriving with race and what, what has happened. And so the first way to reconcile it is to actually understand what's happening and why it's happening and that it's by design. This lack of access isn't just a mistake. It's, it's, it, it's by design. And we have to hold that hardship and understand it and then move on from it. Mm -hmm. Or else we'll be behind the fence, squabbling behind the fence, using our, distributing our limited resources instead of taking down the fence. Great answer. Um, check your links, everybody. Joyce, Dur Joyce Dorado includes a link. Joyce Dorado included a link for organizational assessment. Thank you, Joyce. And I like your comment. Yes, let's shoot for liberation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this is probably about four more minutes. This is my final question, or this is, <clears throat> excuse me, a text final question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your answer to my earlier question about how would you advise clinicians on how to understand what the limitations are when we are often blinded to them? Mm -hmm. I have appreciated your lecture, Jane. Okay, y'all are coming for it. I love this. Mm, chewing on it. So how to advise clinicians where, basically where their blind spots might be? Mm -hmm. Can you read it one more time? Yes. How, could, how would you advise clinicians on how to understand what the limitations are when we are often blinded to them? So maybe not knowing the limitations. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you understand them if you don't under, know what's going on maybe? Great question. Um, I would come at this by saying, assume that there are. Assume that you have them. Lead with that. No, lead with knowing that you have limitations. That way, they when they pop up, you're like, oh, there's one, instead of, oh, what is this, a limitation? Assume that they're baked in to your being because you don't have every walk of life. You don't know everything. We know a lot, y'all. We know a lot. We have a lot of expertise, but we don't know everything. And I love the, the, the real definition of humility. Off too often, it's like this shy self-abasement. Oh, I don't, oh, don't give me compliments. Or it's the other extreme. But real humility is knowing that there's always something more to learn. Now, it might not be textbook learning. It just might be interpersonal experiential learning, right? And so knowing that you always have something more to learn, that everyone you meet, particularly our clients and our patients, is a teacher in some way, particularly when they're difficult. Why are they difficult for me? What are they bringing up for me? You always have something to learn. Everyone's a teacher teacher in some way, whether we want the lesson right now or not, keeps you humble and open enough to meet your limitation rather than be, you know, tackled by it. Uh, meet it with humility, fold it in with compassion, and be willing to not know for a while. Again, as high achievers and experts in our field, we kind of want to, I don't know something, I, lo I see that now, now I know it. With some of this stuff, with the human condition, the social justice work, it's not that quick of a turnaround. You, you get comfortable with not knowing for a while and maybe not even understanding for a while, maybe even being resistant for a while and allowing that maturation to truly change our hearts and minds and thus behaviors is a part of the practice. So assume you have limitations and blind spots, ask questions with safe others that you can ask with and then lean into it, invite it in. Thank you. Um, Marissa included the link to the 1690 team. So check out your chat. There's a link in there. And again, we are going to send out a list of everything. Um, just, we have a minute left, Dr. O'Reilly. Thank you so much for this. I know I speak for our audience because I got so many chat messages about this, how great this was. And thank you. So any, um, Maybe we'll have you back again. Do you have any final parting words for us? I do. I'm, I'm in the process of submitting this for a CE. I think this is something more people should be exposed to. Um, so I'm dropping in the chat right now a uh, five short five-question survey. I would love for y'all to fill it out for me. Um, it will help if, uh, if you know the CE platform says, have you done this before? Do people like it? I can say, well my friends at UCFS said this. So fill out that um, survey for me. It's anonymous. And uh, thank you all for your attention and your willingness to be pulled a little bit. I'm, I'm so excited for the work y'all are gonna do with your clients and patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Megan, for your wonderful wisdom and helping me and all of us to learn about this vitally important work.
and we will end it there. Everybody have a great Tuesday. My pleasure. Take care.